Hello, I'm Krista Kirby, the Livestock Agent at the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Manatee County. Today we're going to be stopping by Longino Ranch and Blackbeard's Ranch to learn about their production styles. We're here with Mr. Cliff Coddington at Longino Ranch in the southeasternmost part of Manatee, Sarasota County at the county lines with the predominantly ranching operation. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Cliff Coddington to give us a little more information about the ranch. I am a fifth generation Manatee County rancher. Uh, was born and raised in Manatee County and have lived all my life there. Um, I came to work for Longino Ranch in 2005. Um, the ranch, the Longino family bought in the mid-1930s. They were in the turpentine business, you know, with synthetic paints and all that. They started looking at other avenues to have this land make income. As they started the ranching, you know, and the turpentine business went out, they started buying a few cows. At that time, Buster Longino, which was... Uh, one of the family members actually leased the whole property from the family and uh, started doing the cow stuff itself. That went along for several years up into the 60s where the uh, family and Mr. Longino decided that he was putting so much money in the land that either he needed a long-term lease to uh, make it worthwhile or uh, he needed the family to buy in or buy in or buy him out. So that's when they actually formed Longino Ranch. Originally the corporation that was in the turpentine business was called Sidel Inc. So they formed Longino Ranch and uh, started raising cattle, buying cattle, improving some ground. And the ranch is a uh, total today of a little over 9,000 acres. About half of that is improved and the other half is still in native lands. It was in 2001, about a third of the ranch went into a conservation easement. Through 2010, we added all the ranch into the uh, conservation easement. So all the ranch except for around our headquarters that has houses, cow pens, is in a conservation easement now. And since 2010, we have purchased another almost 800 acres that was north of us and we're working on trying to get a, a conservation easement. So what type of production systems do we have here at the ranch? Here at the ranch, which of course Ben's the ranch was in the turpentine business, we have pine timber. Um, no longer any turpentine, but we do raise pines, which is originally was sold for um, lumber, ply logs, plywood, um, veneer, but today we are so far away from the actual markets that freight eats us alive. So a lot of our timber today, other than possibly poles, is uh, harvested for either mulch that goes into home builders or pulp wood type stuff. The other enterprises that we have, we're uh, in a wetland, we have a wetland mitigation bank. We also have a uh, gopher tortoise relocation site. And besides being in the cattle business, the citrus business, we also cut the hay of sod. And just recently we formed a new partnership where we're going to be growing some improved sod turf, which will be, uh, you know, type of St. Augustine's, Bermuda grasses and such as that. The ranch also owns some commercial real estate that um, with commercial buildings on it that they get lease money back in from that. So, What are some of your cattle operations and how do you market your animals and what type of animals do you raise here on the ranch? Primarily we're in the, which we are in the beef business. Our breed that we use is mostly Brangus cattle, but we have to keep our Brahma influence on them pretty high. Um, so we keep going back in and we'll um, we are raising some heifers out of uh, our Brahma bulls to go back in our native country. Uh, just the straight bron Brangus cow in our native country has not enough ear to uh, survive. Our cattle are normally sold through video in our lo local livestock markets. 
We do retain some steers that we send to grazing or backgrounding yards to grow from, from the time they leave the ranch. We might keep them another 120 days or so. And we also have been involved in a little bit in feeding. Uh, we normally only feed a portion of them. Sometime our lighter cattle that we feed is what we end up feeding. It depends on the market. And uh, you know, over the past year, it was a good opportunity with the fluctuation in markets to kind of retain some cattle and keep them on into next year. Um, on the heifer side of it, we are retaining mo the majority of our heifers that are going into the replacement market. We keep those, grow them, breed them, and then we sell them as bred heifers. Um, and then we also try to, on the cow side, is try to move a, a few bred cows or replacement older cows that aren't fitting here in the ranch. To keep the operation moving throughout the year, I know you utilize several different types of forages on the operation and also have started uh, a feeding program to help offset. Can you describe some of those different forages and why you chose those grasses? The uh, forage here is uh, Bahia grass. Uh, but we also have some old hemophia fields that are planted. We have some star grass that's here. We have some jigs Bermuda grass. And one that we've been planting a little bit of the last couple of years is Gib Tuck hemophia. Several things that the reason we're doing it is one of it is improved quality of grass. Second is, uh, you know, trying to get our cattle bred. Uh, Bahia grass gets pretty, pretty tough in the wintertime and uh, the quality drops very, very low. Hamathias keep, keep, seems to keep growing during most of the months of the year, some. We just always are looking for a, you know, a grass. Really, we'd love the grass that would grow year round, and, but it's, they're few and far between. So. Um, on our feeding side of it, we had started growing a little silage, sorghum silages and then mid mixing them with some commodities to try to better utilize our, for, you know, mixing the sorghum silage with some of our hemothia silages and then using some commodities to make a, a complete ration to feed the cows. And when we start, you know, we might start them with a, a molasses-based supplement in the fall of the year. And then as we get in close, closer to into winter, as the body condition drops, we will start to supplement these cows as much as six days a week with a ration. Trying to up pregnancy and take advantage of our uh, genetics. With all the different production types you have on the ranch, I'm sure you have some workers that you keep around the ranch on a regular basis, as well as different times of the year increasing that uh, population. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, normally we try to keep um, five to six employees full-time here at the ranch all the time and when we're processing cattle you know we have other employees um, that we hire in just as contract help um, and also with the fruit the same way you know when we're harvesting fruit all those come in at a you know on a contract basis as harvesting sod we contract the sales of that employees without them um, you know things, you know, just doesn't get done. I mean, ranching's a 24-7 job, and uh, it doesn't matter if the COVID has hit or what, animals have to be took care of. You know, irrigation has to be run, and uh, you gotta continue to grow grass so you have something to feed the cows. But so it, you know, continues, employees continue to work, um, which we are fortunate and blessed to be out in the wide open spaces to where, you know, we're not around each other all the time. O over the last couple of years, employees working the ranch life has been very hard to find. I mean, so we always, you know, we could use another two to three employees at any, any time, but it's hard to find them. So we just continue to search and uh, we're always looking for a good hand to, to come in and help us get stuff done. So. With the amount of land that you're managing um, with the ranch and other operations, what do you do to ensure um, 
the environmental aspects of the property. Everything we do as far as the family's values is about the environment. It's not always about a profit. It's about, you know, what is good for the environment. I mean, just recently we were starting a new company which will be the improved sod business and one of the main topics was the environment. You know, what can we do to help the environment? And then also, not only here at the ranch, is growing floor tam or improve grasses good for the state. You know, so it wasn't just here, it was also if it's going into other yards and we're having troubles with, you know, algaes and growing in our water systems, are we hurting the environment to do that? So, you know, as that talk went on, we looked at, you know, on the ranch side, we can make a difference. You know, putting in water control structures, pipes leaving the field, trying to hold water and let it leave slowly to clean the water as it leaves. Um, that's one, for instance, we also, we do a lot of projects with NRCS to where we have a big slough that went through and we put water control structures in it every foot of fall. And it's just to help clean our water if there's a problem with it, but it not only cleans ours, it cleans the water coming from upstream too. We're always control burning, which is good for the native country. It also keeps from wildfires from happening and it's good for the environment. With as much land as you have, what types of wildlife do you see here on the ranch? About anything that could be in Florida, we have at the ranch. Caracaras, eagles. We actually have a couple of hooping cranes that can't, they're banded hooping cranes, but they stay here about half the, half the year that they're here at the ranch. Um, deer, turkeys, uh, quail, if it's in Florida, it's here. That they love you know, water storks and you have a lot of wetlands uh, that, of all sorts of birds that we have here on the ranch. So with all of the positives happening on the ranch, what are some of the challenges that you have faced with the labor force that you have here at the ranch? Challenges with the labor force is getting it here to work. Um, they can go to a job working in the air conditioner and you know, never sweat, and it's hard. You got, to, you got to love it, but you know, once you get them here and they're outside and they get to see the wildlife and, you know, and even they get to hunt, you know, as uh, an employee, we hunt some and, you know, it's just, they, it becomes home and uh, they get to see what God has given us to, to enjoy and take care of, so. What is something you would like everybody else to know about Florida ranches? You know, without Florida ranches, I worry that uh, our waterways, these clear, clean, our air, our waterways, these ranches, and they're multiple. I mean, there's ranches all over the state. It's just not here at Longinot Ranch. There's ranches all over the state. And, you know, this is our environment that cleans the air that we breathe every day. And it also cleans water that's going out and going back into our aquifer. Uh, you know, uh, people think about, you know, fertilizer that the big rancher dumps in there. Well, we can't afford to dump fertilizer out. You know, we've got to make sure it's used correctly and uh, that we don't have any runoff. And, and then again, out of a 10,000 acre ranch, we might only fertilize 300 acres a year. You know, so it's, uh, it's always here to take care of them. It's not just taking care of the ranch and its family, it's taking care of the environment. Well, thank you very much. We enjoy um, hearing everything you have to say about your ranch and learning more. Is there anything you would like to wrap up the segment with? You know, on all products at Ag Graze, I just want people to know that they're wholesome, healthy products, you know, from our beef to citrus, most nutritious product that you can get. So, eat more beef. Our second stop for the day is at Blackbeard's Ranch, and we are now here with Mr. Jim Strickland, the managing partner of the ranch. Welcome to uh, Blackbeard's Ranch, Krista. I'm, I'm glad y'all are here. You're at Blackbeard's Ranch. It's about six miles long. 
We border Mayaka State Park, which is one of our, our most pristine parks, I believe, in the state of Florida. And uh, we border that on our southern boundary for about two miles. The ranch is about six miles long, uh, about two miles deep, sometimes three. We're primarily a cow-calf operation. We do cut some sod, we do some seed, we do some hay, and we, uh, we do quite a few other things. But basically, we are a traditional cow-calf ranch in Florida. What are some of those diversification uh, systems that you have going on here at the ranch? I know you mentioned um, a couple of them, but can you explain what you do with those different operations? Absolutely. So besides the cows of which we, uh, we sell about 600 pound calves and then we keep the heifer calves, the best heifer calves we keep back for replacement cattle, that uh, we feed some of our cattle and it will come back to the ranch as as uh, fed beef, USDA inspected choice, sometimes prime beef that we'll have for sale here or uh, several different restaurants around, around South Florida. In uh, addition to that, we also went into the pig business. We decided if we're going to be in the cattle business and we're going to have visitors to the ranch, that we wanted to have the, the best pork that we could find. So we imported uh, Hungarian and Austrian pigs. They were called the Royal Pigs of Hungary and they're called Mangalitsas. And so we have uh, some of the few mangalises in Florida. We, uh, we have them on a really great operation that they can graze, they can roam, they have oak trees to, to be under. It's not a traditional uh, pig farm, but uh, our pork is, is different than anybody else's. It is a very special pork. Besides being local, it is probably some of the best pork in the world. Some of the people have said it's like the Kobe beef of the pork world. So in addition to that, we also, we also have guava jelly. Uh, you know, we try to utilize everything on the ranch. Whenever they talk about being sustainable, to be sustainable, you have to be profitable and you have to really work every angle that you can get. So we have, we have guavas and uh, we've got a lady that's inspected that makes our guava jelly. In addition to that, if we're going to stay on the, food, on the food business, is that we have Blackbeard's Ranch Wildflower Honey. And where we position our bees on the ranch, because it's so large, that the bees never leave the ranch unless they go to Mayaka State Park. So our bees will not get into golf courses, residential areas, garbage cans. They won't get into Coke cans, beer bottles. Ours feed solely on the same uh, wildflowers that have been, in here, been here in Florida uh, since... Uh, the first Spaniards uh, that uh, discovered Florida came. So, so if you ever get a chance to try Blackbeard's Ranch honey, it's the same honey that the, the Calusa Indians ate, and it's the same honey that Ponce de Leon and, and all the Spanish explorers that uh, discovered La Floridita, or Florida, um, what they ate whenever they got to Florida. Since you have so many different products that you're selling, um, and they are local products. Where do people find uh, your products, whether it be in restaurants or to purchase? I could tell you one of the first restaurants that uh, utilized our products was uh, Sean Murphy's Beach Bistro out on Anna Marie Island. Uh, you know, he was one of the first restaurants in this whole area from Tampa to Naples to be rated as a, a Zagat's, rated as Michelin uh, star. Uh, it is, to me, one of the very best restaurants there is along this coast, if not Florida. He was one of the first that utilized it. Uh, Founders Market and uh, Bistro down in Naples, uh, they, have, they have some of our product. But I can tell you, um, a lot of other people had our products. And we are, just like everybody that's watching this, have been a product of uh, what happened during the pandemic. It changed. To do all of these operations, what do you have as far as employees here at the ranch? Uh, my employees are great and they're hardworking and uh, we don't have many of them. We, uh, we have Brian Jones, which is a ranch manager, his wife Cassidy, and she certainly helps us with the, uh, with the food and a lot of uh, other projects around here that we have. We've been really blessed to uh, uh, have some other folks that that really work hard, that, that gave us the ideas for a lot of this, that participate, and some of them as, as partners on, on what we do um, here. Besides, besides what we uh, do with, with the food products, we also harvest palm trees for uh, roadsides, I-75 expansion, 
uh, as they're doing the uh, nursery landscaping. We have shipped a lot of our uh, uh, cabbage palms to uh, Bahamas and they went into the developments there. So that gives us a little bit of in income stream too. Environmental issues are always a major concern on ranches. How do you address the environmental uh, issues um, and what are some of the protections you have in place? Well, you know, that's probably one of the greatest questions that you could ask a, a rancher or a landowner in, uh, in the United States now, but particularly in Florida with a thousand people a day coming into Florida. Uh, we're seeing a lot of changes here and I'm not anti-development. Uh, I'm more of a yin and a yang guy that, you know, look at what brought these people to Florida and let's try to protect it for them. Uh, my children, my grandchildren, and uh, your grandchildren, and, and uh, all those folks that come behind us. So asking that question, it opened up kind of a big can of worms because I asked myself the same question. And I said, you know, what can I do? And that's why we formed a nonprofit group. And our nonprofit is Florida Conservation Group. And that's made up of ranchers and scientists. So uh, Julie Morris, myself, Dr. Tom Hochter from University of Florida, uh, really uh, Lefty Durando, uh, big rancher over around the middle of the state, Northern Everglades, formed this group. We, uh, and it's made up of ranchers and it's made up of scientists. And it's very close to my heart because we banded together to answer that question you posed to me. A lot of other ranchers have been posed that question and they said, I don't know what I can do. We can work together. So that's why that group was formed. So Florida Conservation Group has done a lot of land preservation. We've done a lot of advocacy for funding. If we're going to be, remember back to where if we're going to be sustainable, we have to be profitable. There's cost share programs that Florida Conservation Group has lobbied for and, and gotten accomplished on, on state and local and on federal levels. We work with a lot of folks in Washington, D.C. So with this group, and it made up of ranchers and scientists, a lot of scientists, we bring everything to the table and we can help with land conservation. We can help with land practices. As a group, we can do these things. We do lobbying every day to preserve this green space we see behind me. What are some of the things that are given back by preserving these lands? to the general public? Well, whenever we preserve these lands, one is, you know, one is what's the most important thing in the state of Florida? I would say water. And so whenever you have these landscapes like uh, this ranch, Longino Ranch, uh, any number of these large, uh, large ranches through here, that we help filter water, we slow the water down. A lot of us hold water. That we have structures of which when that water comes into us, we hold water trying to reestablish some of those historic highs and lows of these wetland areas, these ephemeral ponds. And so we do that uh, along with cost share programs. A lot of the federal government, NRCS, Manatee County that, uh, that works with uh, NRCS, that works with a lot of these programs. Uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and Nikki Freed, our Commissioner of Agriculture. They have a lot of cost share programs that help us in doing those, those, those kind of things. But besides the water, we're looking at endangered species, that this land provides a lot of habitat for endangered species. So whether it's a panther, whether it's a bear, whether it's an indigo snake or a gopher tortoise, bald eagle, we have them all here, white-tailed deer. Uh, you know, so we, we provide that. We also provide, if you will, um, pathways from Mayaka State Park, maybe to Highlands Park. So these are areas or these are pathways or corridors that these animals can travel back and to from government-owned land, meaning the citizens of Florida, to uh, private lands, and they can utilize these. The same way with water. Water travels uh, within all these different areas, and, and we provide that. We could go on about carbon sequestration. I mean, we all hear about it. We're all looking at it. We're looking at it as an income source for ranchers, and so we're working at that. We're actually doing some studies with probiotics here on, here on this ranch. Uh, along with two other ranches in the state of Florida. Uh, that will be one of the first of using probiotics, which really help the soil health. Uh, and then it helps to sequester more carbon. But we're going to know because we do follow science that cowboys will be cowboys. But when you become 
uh, a manager of a ranch or an owner of a ranch, um, or you take a real pride in a ranch as, as a ranch manager and employee, you take a real pride in, in, that, in that ranch operation and you want to do these things too. So you spoke about my, my employees, they're great. They bought into this vision of we have to make money. We have to make money to, to keep the ranch. But we can be a little different and we can help educate people as we go. What are some of the general challenges that you encounter as a rancher here in Manatee County? Well, let's see. The most recent one has been the pandemic. Uh, that one has been uh, a heartbreaker for so many people that are going to watch this. Um, I've lost three really good friends. There was a Manatee County Commissioner, Gwen Brown. Um, I, I really got along well with Gwen. She helped me a lot. Um, Mr. Dakin that just, just recently passed. So but besides those, there's a lot of other people that have lost loved ones or, you know, they haven't been able to see their loved ones in a long time. Uh, I've got a mother I have not actually been face to face with her in right at four and a half months. And I'm no different than a lot of other people that live here in Florida that have parents or they have children. Um, so the pandemic changed a lot of the economics too, besides the personal aspects of it. It changed a lot. We were had here, we had a lot of meat prepared to go into these great restaurants from Tampa to Naples, to over to Orlando, Tallahassee. And when they shut down, we had a lot of meat sitting there. We made a decision that we were going to try to donate it to hospitals because of those first responders, those, those people that were putting literally their lives kind of on the line at that time, working overtime to help society. And we couldn't do it logistically. Uh, it just didn't work. So we went one step back. My father was a fireman. And uh, so we decided we would reach out to the fire departments of Manatee and Sarasota County. So they got some of the <laughs> finest local beef produced USDA prime aged beef that you could have gotten in the best restaurants. And we were very happy to, uh, to load our trucks up and make those donations to, to the fire departments. Is there a way for the general public to help out with some of these challenges? Absolutely. You know, in the state of Florida right now, we're one half of 1% of the pop voting population of Florida, meaning we, meaning agriculture, basically agriculture, but you narrowed it down to, to ranchers. Uh, that goes to show you how much clout we have, which is not a whole lot. It's hard to look at, say, less than 1% of the voting population and decide they really should matter. You can help us matter. You can, you can look at what we do. You can really read those pieces that are done on ranches, the ecology of ranches, uh, the environmental aspects, the conservation efforts that are being put forth. Help us on funding. Um, right now, uh, right now, we're looking at federal funding, we're looking at farm bills, we're looking at NIFWIF funding, we're looking at REPI funding, which is, and I'm using acronyms that nobody knows, REPI is for uh, military bases. And so we lobby uh, f on a federal level for that. Surrounding properties that we can do conservation easements on. We're not looking to buy property and take it off the tax rolls and put it to county or local or federal uh, state uh, management. What we're saying is that there's a great amount of people that voted for an amendment that believed in conservation about five years ago, overwhelmingly, I think it was 76%, that voted for that amendment that said we want to conserve Florida. This is a way you can conserve Florida, but you have to help us on coming up with the funding mechanisms to conserve it. We've already said we want to, overwhelmingly said we wanted to help us. That's one of the reasons Florida Conservation Group is here. Look us up at floridaconservation.org. Uh, you can help us there. There's a lot of other environmental groups out there too. This happens to be the rancher and scientist group. This is the one that I know what they do. I know that when we wake up in the morning, we don't have to generate enough funds to pay a lot of employees. We all are volunteers trying to save green space, uh, have good water, have air. We haven't even talked about oxygen and air and forest and all those different things. Another one of those conversations we can have one day. Do you have any final thoughts you would like to uh, provide about ranching and to everyone watching today? Well, you picked a really great day to be here. I don't know when this is going to air, but this is voting day. 
And everybody's paying attention to the amount of people that got up, woke up, weeks ahead of this day, this Tuesday in November, to make a decision. And whoever you voted for, that's your decision and that's the way it works. I'm just so proud, very proud, that today's voting day and we've had a tremendous amount of people that have come out of the woods uh, to, to vote. Now, once we get that in place, let's, uh, let's make peace with each other. Let's work together because we've got a lot of things on the table that we all, Democrats and Republicans, have to work together. That's on the big level. Uh, in working together, we can help facilitate those things that are going to keep us in business. And we're not looking for handouts. We want to quantify those things which we do for that 98.5% of the population that live in Florida, those 22 million people that live in Florida. We want to show them what we do for them and then hopefully they'll recognize uh, the fact that we are worth saving and we're worth helping.